Doing all right? Doing good. It is fall, everybody. It is warm. I mean, it's not warm. It's cold. It's chilly. That's why I got my coffee here from The Link. For those of you who don't know, The Link is our, ca- our cafe back in the back here at Faith Journey. And uh, 100% of what comes out to The Link, I mean, coffee, drip coffee is always free, hot chocolate, things like that. But if you want a fancy drink like so... All of that goes to help kingdom builders. So that supports our missions emphasis here across the street, around the world, everything that's happening here. So in addition to the, the monthly support that you are giving to, to support kingdom builders, we are doing this week in, week out, through the link, through coffee like this. I'm enjoying my mocha, and I'm supporting missions. It's amazing. All right? So I was going to take a drink right there. It seemed like a good moment. Um, my name is Jason. For those of you who I haven't got a chance to meet yet, I'm so thankful that you are here with us today at Faith Journey. We are in a series today. We're in week two of our series, Snapshots of Faith. And Snapshots of Faith uh, is, a, is literally just that. There are pictures of faith, little snapshots all throughout uh, Scripture. And we just taking, we're taking a few of these little bits and pieces, these snapshots for these few weeks, some interactions of faith in life, that these intersections that between faith and life that we see, we're seeing instances where faith is lived out on, in daily situations. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Somewhere between the tangible and the intangible is this kind of substantive faith, this, this belief. It's not a formality. It's not a feeling. It's not something that you just kind of feel a gut hunch in yourself. It's not a formula. You can't create some equation that equates to faith. It is something, it's more than that. Faith is the willingness to abide in, the, in, you know, in place, the ramifications of which we may not fully understand. It is patience with mystery. Now, this past week, Jen and I got to uh, go out a little bit. We were celebrating uh, just kind of our, our anniversary of sorts, a little delayed celebration of an anniversary. And we went up to uh, Vancouver, and we were able to see a little, the Capilano Suspension Bridge. This is, in, this is in British Columbia, people, not Vancouver, right across the river, right? Okay, the Capilano Suspension Bridge is just that, right? It's a suspension bridge. And if you've never been on a suspension bridge, uh, it's not the most sturdy thing in the world, right? It wobbles, right? It moves, it shakes. And, uh, and so here we are on this suspension bridge. It's long, it's great, it's, it's, it's a must-see. But I will say that Jen's hands are pretty tight on the tension rods there, on the rails, uh, you, 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 it's, it's one of those things, and she likes to poke fun at me. She's like, you're trying to be too cool. Like, you were trying to do it without holding on to anything. And, yeah, that's right, because, you know, I, I knew. But we, you get, so here's the interesting thing. Behind us was a group of ladies who were all nervous about the suspension bridge. They weren't sure if they wanted to get tickets to go across it. They're like, they wanted to ask, does it wobble? And I'm thinking, of course it wobbles. It's a suspension bridge. But you go ahead and ask the ticket agent to see if it, and so they decided they're not going to do it because they're too fearful of the wobbling of the suspension bridge. And of course, as adventurous as Jen and I are, we're like, we got this, we're okay. And then we kind of white knuckle it across, right? And we kind of we, we see it. But then we get to the other side of the suspension bridge, and you see this placard where this, you know, 200, 300-year-old tree at one time fell on said suspension bridge. And, of course, that did not ease Jen's fears at all at that moment. Like, this thing could happen at any moment. Of course, the bridge probably broke, right? No, no, no. The bridge didn't break at all. In fact, the tree broke and went down. We have a picture of the tree, the, what was left of the tree on the suspension bridge. It never broke. And I said, see, you got to have faith and believe that this suspension bridge can hold tons and tons. Man, there are hundreds if not thousands of people that go across this every single day. But something inside of us, when we walk over something that's a little bit shaky, makes us not have complete faith and certainty. And what's what, what the next step, even if we see a picture of something that is just massive, fall, laying on it, and we're like, it can hold that, it can hold me. Yeah, but it's still kind of wobbly, and I'm still kind of shaking a little bit. And there's a, there's a little bit of intrepidation. Faith is somewhat 
like that. We have to have the certainty of things that are hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. And the essence of faith, like we talked about last week, is God leaning in and whispering, trust me, trust me. Now, last Sunday we took a look at a snapshot of a Roman centurion who believed that Jesus could heal his servant from where he was. He wasn't next to his servant. In fact, he was a ways away. He believed that Jesus could heal his servant from where Jesus was, that Jesus' power was not limited by distance. Do we believe that? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Today we're going to take another snap, look at another snapshot of faith. It's recorded in Mark chapter 5. And I believe that it's something that we can relate to. To this snapshot of faith. And I'm going to do something. It's going to be a little bit of a lengthy read. But I want to read the entire account here. Starting in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 5. Sorry, Mark chapter 5. And uh, then we're going to discuss it a little bit. So we're starting in verse 21. uh, This is what it says. Jesus got into the boat again. And went back to the other side of the lake. Where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then... A leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered 12 for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors And and over the years had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And, after he, he, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, your suffering is over. Now, while he was still speaking to her, messengers from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, uh, came, came. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside, and why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. And the crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. And holding her hand, he said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. For the next few moments, I want to talk to us about the tension of timing. Let's pray. Father, for the next few moments as we have here today, I pray that you will just illuminate things through this account, through through your word, and that you will reveal things to our heart that we can apply as we learn to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Timing can be a tense thing. Can it be a tense thing? Usually when we need something, especially from God, uh, timing is something that, you know, we want it then. We want it right then. We need it right now. We want it our way, right away. And it doesn't always happen that way, right? Sometimes God says, wait. Sometimes God is a little bit behind, behind or just different, in conflict maybe with our timing desires. Jairus, I'm sure, was at home, bedside, doing, you know, not knowing what he could do, realizing he can't do anything else. Uh, and he just, uh, hey, but he had to do something. He had to do something. And he had heard about Jesus, and maybe as, out of a, as a last resort, or maybe out of belief, he comes rushing to Jesus to find this man who has already healed so many people in his ministry. 
And so he's, and it's, what's interesting is that this is a synagogue leader, right? This is a religious leader who is, who is looking to Jesus, who is reaching out to Jesus, almost in a, in, a, in a last resort. I've tried everything else. I don't know what else to do, but my daughter is dying. I need to do something. I can't just sit here and watch her die. Many of us come to God as a last resort, too. Coming to God should be our first response not our last resort. A lot of times we come to God at the end of our rope, at the end of everything else we've tried. We've tried everything we know how to try, and we're like, you know what? Okay, maybe, maybe I'll give God a chance now to intervene in my life. Timing can be a tense thing. It should be, a la- it should, should be our first response, not our last resort. Now, the woman, the woman with the issue of blood, she, something in her has to just reach out and touch Jesus' garment, right? The crowd is pressing in. She has had it ingrained in her mind. She thought to herself, Mark tells us, that if she just touches his robe, she's going to be he- healed. It's ingrained in her mind. That's, that's what she needs to do. She is moved to move. And here's the thing about faith. It jump starts our feet. Faith jumpstarts our feet. Both of these people, out of desperation and out of faith, actually did something. They moved. They got up and they did something. They didn't just sit around and hope their circumstances got better. Sometimes you got to hustle over hope. You know, I hope one day... I hope one day I'll win the lottery. I hope one day I'll have a nice house. I hope one day my business will grow. I hope one day, right? You know, we, we don't get to, uh, too far with just hoping, right? You got to hustle over hope. In fact, I would call it the Snow White work ethic, right? You know, you know she's at the well. She's singing, I'm wishing, I'm wishing, right, for the one I love to find me today. I'm just going to go through my life just wishing and hoping and sometime, someday this person will find me. I'm wishing, I'm wishing for a new car to find me today, to find me today. We got to move from wishing to working, from hoping to hustling. The difference between those who do something and those who don't do something is that those who do something do something. Right? Our faith should jumpstart action. It should jumpstart our feet. It should propel us to move and do things that are bigger than us because we believe in one who is bigger than us. When we are tempted to sit and hope, and maybe in our own demise, and just kind of like this idea of, I have nowhere else to go. I don't know what else to do. I can't. I'm in despair. But our faith actually jumpstart our feet also. And maybe we need to be reminded of this. Maybe we're learning it for the first time today. Christian faith resides in uh, the person of Jesus, not in our plans. Our faith resides in a person, not in plans. In a person of the person of Jesus and not in our plans. This is why tension of timing is so real in our lives. Our timing is different than God's timing. Twelve years. Twelve years. It felt like forever to the woman with the issue of blood. Right? Could you imagine? Maybe you can. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you've been going through something for a long time. Maybe it's been years. Maybe it's been 12 years. Maybe it's been longer than that. It feels like forever. She tried everything to get better. She had spent all that she had going to doctors and got no better. It actually only grew worse, the scripture says. According to the law, this woman's condition would have made her ritually unclean and would exclude her from social relationships. Uh, and as anything that she touched was also considered unclean. Like a leper, this woman would have been, had, would have been forced to live alone, isolated from others. She would have been forced to do all life all on her own. Twelve years is a long time. She's destitute, she's impoverished, she doesn't know where else to turn, and somehow she's in this crowd, and she thinks to herself, all I have to do is just touch Jesus' robe. I've heard him, I've seen him, this is somebody, I believe that if I can just have faith enough to touch his robe, I will be healed. Twelve years is a long time. But for Jairus and his, and his wife and his daughter, twelve years was too short. This girl was twelve years old. 
She's only 12 and her, his, she's dying. She's a little girl. It's the only daughter, Luke tells us. The same amount of time. But the experience of these years was vastly different. 12 years seemed like too long. And 12 years seemed like too short. This young girl lived her 12 years in relationship with her parents and her community, about to enter womanhood herself, while the other woman lived alone, outside of community, unclean, isolated from others. Jairus finds Jesus as he returns kind of to the shore, and he, and he pleaded for him to come and heal his daughter. I don't know what it would take. Just think about it from the context of what we know about Jesus and what we know about the religious leaders of that day. It was not common at all for a religious Jewish leader to go plead with Jesus to come heal his, his daughter, right? They were looking for ways to trap Jesus, not to have him come do some miracles. But Things change when it's your only daughter, right? When it's your only kid. And you're like, gee, I've seen you do miracles. I don't understand it fully. I'm not sure I 100% agree with it. But I, I'm coming to you, Jesus, because I believe that you can, you can do something. Just lay your hands on her and she will be healed. And Jesus agrees. He goes with them. But he's delayed, right? He de- Jesus delays his trip to identify someone who touched him in a crushing crowd of people. It seems crazy. Think about it from Jairus' perspective, right? He's trying to get to his house as quickly as he possibly can because he doesn't know how many minutes his daughter has left. Yet the crowd is pressing in on Jesus. Somebody touches Jesus. Jesus stops to identify who touched me. Jairus is losing his mind. doesn't matter who touched you, Jesus. Come on, we got to go. To Jairus, every second mattered. Every second was delayed, what, you know, was significant to him. And when they finally arrive at the house, she's dead. So close. If only Jesus had been there, maybe, maybe she would not have died. Ironically, this is the same response that Mary and Martha give to Jesus when their brother Lazarus has also died. If only you had been here sooner, maybe he would not have died. If only God had intervened differently or sooner in our li- or for something in our lives, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Maybe, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation that we find ourselves in or have to experience the pain or the loss or the suffering that I'm experiencing right now. This is the tension of faith and the tension of that, that in God's timing, uh, it's God's timing. It's his purpose. It's his plans. And they're different than ours. His purpose is always For his glory, working for our good, and often using time and process to help get us to the end of ourselves and our own assumptions of self-sufficiency so that we can learn dependency and sufficiency in him alone. It's a tough lesson. We don't want to learn it with our 12-year-old kid on their deathbed. It's not an easy lesson. It's the tension of our timing versus his timing. And we want what we need, we feel like we need in the moment versus what, what he knows that we need in the long term. It's a tension that we have to manage somehow. And it's this faith tension that exists in our lives. Trusting him when he says, trust me. To, you know, what, when we see what our primary need is, is often clouded to what he knows what we actually need. He's always leaning in. He's also always whispering, trust me, trust me. Oh, yeah? My daughter just died, Jesus. Why should I trust you? I've had this instance happen in my life over and over again. I feel like I can never get ahead. I feel like all the things are stacked up against me. Why should I trust you? Trust me. Trust me. Our faith is patience with mystery. And when we are in a critical situation, when we are a crisis moment, guess what goes first? Our patience, right? Our patience, our trust. 
Trust when it doesn't line up with our thinking. Trust when it doesn't line up who, with what, we're, what we feel like we need in the moment. But we have to trust him. And we also have to trust him to define reality and truth, not the crowd. The disciples were confounded with Jesus' question. Who touched me? I mean, they're stressing out about this. They're, they're telling him, that, you know, what seemed obvious, right? Like, everybody's touching you, dude. Like, come on. Like, why are you trying to single this out? We got somewhere, we got some places to go. We got some places to be. You know, Jairus' daughter's trying to get, you know, is, is suffering. We got to go. And Mark notes that Jesus looked around. He's trying to identify who, who was it. Kind of to the probable confusion of the disciples. But the woman knew, Mark says, knew what he was doing and responded. The crowd viewed the woman as unhealable and unclean, beyond help. She's got, she's got this thing, I don't understand it, but it's beyond help, it's not. But Jesus saw her and actually sought her out, changing her reality through relationship with him and bringing her back from death to life. He sought this woman out, which is different. All she was doing was trying to, trying to get some relief from her physical ailment, what seemed noticeable to her and to everybody else. She was not beyond his capacity or concern. And Jesus sought her out. And the men, the men who arrived from Jairus' home, believed that death meant the end of Jesus' ability to heal. Right? Right? He, he, they believe that. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher any longer? Don't trouble him any longer. It doesn't matter. It's done. It's over with. It's unsolvable. The professional mourners laughed at Jesus when he, when he said the child is not dead. She's only asleep. They're laughing at him and he comes, of course, kicks them all out. When all hope seems lost, when life goes from bad to dead, we need to see things not like the crowd sees them, but like Jesus sees them. Each touch matters. Even death can't contain or disrupt the purposes and the provision of God. We see these two stories of faith, these two snapshots of faith juxtaposed together. And we see what's happening with Jairus and his family and this other woman. We're both going through critical things in their lives. And Jesus has compassion for both of them at the same time. And both of them are operating to some degree of faith. When troubles around us seem insurmountable, when the waves are crashing over us left and right, we're finding ourselves, we're fighting for every breath. We've tried everything that we can try. We need to remind ourselves to, of what Jesus said to Jairus and his wife in verse 36. It says, don't be afraid, just have faith. Don't be afraid. Keep believing. Keep believing. Both Jairus and the woman had a plan that Jesus disrupted. Jairus re rightly believed that Jesus could heal his daughter and make her well, needing only to lay his hands on her. But this belief was challenged and produced fear when his daughter died. The woman's plan was to remain unknown and unseen, kind of retaining her position on the outside and seeking only physical relief from her perpetual bleeding. She only wanted that. Jesus disrupted both of their plans because our faith doesn't reside in a thing like the laying on of hands or the touching of a robe. It resides in the relationship with the person of Jesus. Jesus challenged Jairus to stop fearing and to keep believing. Jairus, I know it looks down. I know it looks insurmountable. I know it looks unsolvable. I know it looks like nothing can change this. It looks final. It looks done. But stop fearing and keep believing in him. Even when it seems impossible. Jesus expanded the woman's plan by not just healing her physically, but seeing her, seeking her out, connecting with her relationally, 
providing wholeness to her healing and addressing her felt need as well as her actual physical need. Her felt need of, and her actual need of relationship with him. These two snapshots of faith kind of intertwined speaks to the lives of people just like you and me. From fear and urgency of sickness and death that turn a respected community religious leader into an imploring father on his knees to the hopelessness and the helplessness of a woman seeking relief from every source imaginable without seeing any results We can relate. These are our experiences. We experience suffering. We experience struggle. We experience fear. We experience loss. We attempt our plans but see our capacity uh, as insufficient or too late, feeling like life is too long or too short and God's delayed or he's absent in our need. But the lesson of this young girl and the older woman is just the opposite, that God loves us that he sees us, that he seeks us out. He shows us his mercy and compassion. Even in the midst of our sinfulness, he is leaning in and saying, trust me. We can trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And we can't lean on on our own understanding. We have to acknowledge him in all of our ways. And he will guide our paths. Our faith resides in the person of Jesus who love us, gave himself for us. And while we may may feel overwhelmed and alone, he is here and his timing and purpose are perfect. Perfect. So how do you need to move today? Maybe you need to let your faith jumpstart your feet. Maybe you've been listening too much to the crowd and instead you need to Trust Jesus instead of the crowd around you. And remind yourself that God has your best interest in mind. And it doesn't mean that every experience will be pleasant. These two snapshots of faith, neither one of them would we wish on anybody, right? Neither one of them are pleasant. We have a girl who's dying and we have a woman who's been dealing with something for 12 years that is just causing her pain and just... None of them, neither of them are pleasant. We don't go through all pleasant times anyways, either. But if we trust him and we trust that God has our best interest in mind, what it does, it will bring us closer to him and it will bring us wholeness that we may not have realized that we needed all along. Because sometimes we're focused on the immediacy of the, of the need at hand. Where God is saying, you know what, not only do I want to heal you, I don't want to just bring relief to you from your, to your noticeable symptoms. I want to heal the whole you. I want to bring wholeness to you. Maybe you need to be reminded that your faith should reside in the person of Jesus, not your own plans. That you need to have faith in the middle. Faith in the delay. Faith in the interruption. The craziest thing about this story is that Jairus finds Jesus. He's going with him, and then there's an interruption in these plans. And we can lose our mind in the interruptions of life sometimes. The things don't seem to be according to plan. When there's something that's delayed or interrupted or disrupted, can we still have faith in the middle? Faith in the delay. Faith through the interruption that we can trust in him with all of our heart and trust his timing. Not just sit around and wish and hope, but trust him. And when we trust him, it actually causes us to get out and activate our faith in him, to jumpstart our faith, to actually do something. Reason we know about these stories in Mark chapter 5 is because Jairus left his home to go find Jesus. Because the woman left her secluded place, even though she was unclean and just rejected by society, and was like, if I can just get through this crowd and I can just touch his robe, then everything will be different. They actually got up and did something. Man, maybe that's something we need to do. It's 
Maybe you need to trust in the person and not our, your own plans. Maybe you need to be reminded to remember what God says and not the crowd. And maybe you just need to move. Either way, this snapshot of faith, I believe, is something that we all can relate to. Trust in him with all your heart. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, this is crazy story that's recorded in Matthew 5 where we see just life and faith intersect. Where Jesus had certain plans all along. He didn't know that this was going to happen in his life where then Jairus comes and finds him and he is thrust away to this, this location. In the middle of that, something else happens. God, I pray for each one of us today that we will have the faith in your timing. That we will trust your timing. That we know that it may not be our timing. But that we can remind ourselves that you are God. Father, this morning I want to pray for those who maybe for the first time today. Or maybe it's the first time in a long time and they're coming to this decision point again. They're saying, God, I want to put my trust in you. I've tried everything else. I've done everything else. Nothing is work working. In fact, it's getting worse. God, I'm coming to you. I believe that only you can solve the impossible situation that is in my life right now. God, I know that you can heal hearts, that you can bring us into relationship with you. You've shown it over and over and over again, and he showed it to us here in this snapshot of faith. And I know that you can do that with all of us today. So I pray for that person who's on that decision point. God, that they will just come to you and say, God, I trust you. I'm putting, placing my trust in you. And God, I pray for all of us who, that we will be reminded to trust you more, to trust you when it doesn't seem like things are working out, to trust in your timing. To trust you in the middle. Have faith in the delay. Have faith through the interruptions. To be reminded about what you say and not be influenced by just the crowd. But remember to not fear, just to keep having faith, keep believing. And to always remind ourselves that our faith resides in you and not in our plans. Father, we love you. We thank you. We put our trust in you because you are God. You love us. You're the God of the universe, the creator. God, you reign. You reign.